Hello and welcome to Cleaver Fulton Reckon's webinar, Using Legal Services to Manufacture Your Way Through the COVID-19 Pandemic. My name is Aaron Moore. I'm a director and head of the manufacturing team at Cleaver Fulton Reckon, and I'm also your host for today. Due to the devastating economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, our manufacturing clients are using our advice to navigate the new business environment. At Cleaver Fulton Reckon, we've drawn from our fast experience across our specialist practice areas, and designed a series of solutions to support your manufacturing business. Our legal services can help you to improve cash flow, maintain company stability, and indeed increase your revenue. Before we kick off our webinar, I wanted to share our new manufacturing business audit designed to help you understand the key strategic issues you should be urgently addressing. Please visit cleaverfiltonrankin.co.uk forward slash COVID-19 to access this audit. Over the course of this webinar, we will address some topics raised within our business audit, including issues on employment, company structure, contracts and real estate. We may not answer all of your questions in this webinar, so please do take 10 minutes to complete the audit and we will get in touch to address any specific issues your business may be facing. Alternatively, contact us using the direct contact details found at cleaverfieldandrankin.co.uk forward slash people. So let's get started with the introductions. Joining me today on the webinar, we have four Cleaver Fulton Rankin Directors. Ashleen Byrne, Director of Employment and Data Protection. Jeanette Donahoe, Director of Insolvency and Business Restructuring. Hilary Griffith, Director of Corporate and Commercial. And Joe Marley, Director of Commercial Real Estate. Welcome everybody and thank you for joining me today. Darren. Hi. Morning, Aaron. Hi. So, that's the sort of formal bit over and, and hopefully we're going to have a bit of a Q&A here. So Ashleen, I'm going to um, start with you um, in terms of some burning employment issues, if that's okay. So Ashleen, one of the questions that we've seen um, quite recently and as, indeed as recently as Friday is that further information was released on Friday in relation to the job retention scheme. What are the main points that manufacturing employers should be aware of? Yep, so the job retention scheme has been a, a lifeline for many businesses in Northern Ireland, including the manufacturing sector, um, where manufacturers have either suffered a closure or they're operating at a reduced level. So I know that many manufacturing businesses are using the scheme currently. We did know that the scheme was due to close on the 31st of October, but we didn't know how that was going to operate in terms of people being able to come back and work part time. So thankfully, we have a little bit of clarification in relation to that. So employees can come back to work on a part time basis if they've been furloughed from the 1st of July. Further guidance is going to be issued on the 12th of June. Um, but it seems to be that you can use any working pattern. So the employer will pay the employee for the hours that they work and then claim for the hours that they're not working under the job retention scheme. So I think that's good news for many businesses, including the manufacturing sector. Um, the, the other clarification was that the last date on which employees can join the scheme is the 10th of June. So if employees aren't on the scheme by that date, employers aren't going to be able to rely on the job retention scheme. So that's really a key date for manufacturing employers to bear in mind if they do want to rotate people or introduce people onto the scheme they need to act very quickly and do it as soon as possible. Um, the other key date is that from the 1st of August, employers are going to have to make a contribution in relation to employers' national insurance and pension contributions. They have been able to make that claim under the scheme, so that's going to change from the 1st of August. And then there's going to be a tapering off in relation to the scheme in September and October. So presently, employers can claim 80% of an employee's wage up to £2,500. That's going to taper off in September. So the employer will have to make a contribution of 10% and then it will increase uh, to 20% in, in October. And then the scheme will come to an end on the 31st of October. So the changes aren't as drastic as I think we, we anticipated. I think many people were expecting a higher contribution to have to come from the employer. So I think it's probably good news generally, you know, that the scheme is going to continue in its current format and the flexibility that's been introduced from the 1st of July will be you know, a very welcome um, change for many employers. Thanks for that, Ashley. So I guess, yeah, I mean, with a, with a manufacturing hat on the, the key takeaway points there are um, be very alive to the date by which people can actually be furloughed. 
um, and be aware of the flexibility and, and use the flexibility to, to suit your business needs. That's, that's useful. Jeanette, that probably leads quite nicely then onto a question that's been submitted in terms of company stability. Um, and one that has come in is, is phrased along the lines that our business has just reopened after being closed for eight weeks due to the COVID-19 lockdown. We're likely to default in the payments due to the bank. What steps can the bank take to obtain payment? Um, thanks, Arne. Um, so the contractual relationship which your business currently has with its bank will be contained in the facility letters, loan agreements, security, and other documents which you have entered into. It is therefore very important that you instruct a lawyer to review the, um, these documents really as soon as possible to advise you on the content. So the bank's options to seek repayment will depend upon whether or not the facilities are secured or unsecured. If the credit is relatively small, it is most likely to be the case that the facilities will be unsecured. Um, for any larger amounts, it is likely that the bank will have obtained a suite of security documents um, over business assets and possibly personal recourse against the directors by way of personal guarantees. Um, if the loan is secured or unsecured, the bank will take the first step of issuing a demand letter. And um, in respect of unsecured amounts, if that amount uh, is not repaid, the bank will issue proceedings in either the county court or the high court seeking a judgment for repayment of the full amount due. If there is no dispute in respect of the amount due, the bank could take a more aggressive approach and issue a statutory demand against the business. And if this is not repaid within 21 days, the bank could then proceed to issue either a winding up petition, if it's a corporate entity or a bankruptcy petition, if you're trading your business as a sole trader, to place the business into either liquidation or bankruptcy. So some good news um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and what is due to become law very, very soon, by way of the introduction of the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Bill, there is a temporary stay on winding up petitions being issued until after the 30th of June 2020. In respect of security, if the bank holds fixed charge security in respect of the amount due, such as a charge on the company property, then the bank could issue a demand letter and proceed with the appointment of a fixed charge receiver. The receiver has the power to immediately take possession of the property over which they're appointed. They collect rent, they take control, and ultimately they'll place the property on the open market for sale with any sale proceeds being applied to repay the bank's debt. If the bank has floating charge security, which is security over movable property, such as cash, stock, debtor book, um, this is usually found in a document which is called a debenture. Uh, this security will allow the bank to appoint an administrator, which is an insolvency protectioner, who takes control of the entire business and its assets on the day of appointment. The administrator's duty is to assess the viability of the business as a going concern and decide whether the business or parts of it can be saved, or if not, to realise the assets of the company for the benefit of the creditors as a whole. I would stress that the appointment of a receiver and the appointment of administrator can take place immediately upon the expiry of the period of time in the demand letter. Um, and I have seen that period being as little as 24 hours. Therefore, if you do receive a demand letter from your bank, you really do need to seek advice from a lawyer immediately as failure to engage um, with the bank at an early stage could lead to the immediate loss of control of your business and the business assets. If you've signed a personal guarantee in respect of any facilities to your business, the bank could call on the guarantee and you personally could be asked to repay the amount due by the business to the bank. It is therefore very important that if you feel that you're in breach of the terms of your banking facilities now, or could be in the future, that you seek advice from a lawyer as soon as possible, as breaching the terms of your credit arrangements could have a devastating impact on your business. Early dialogue with the bank may open up avenues to restructure loans, extend repayment terms, or increase your facilities to allow you to continue to trade and ultimately save your business, which may not be available if you do nothing and bury your head in the sand. Thanks for that, Jeanette. Um, I suppose, again, with you know the experience in the manufacturing sector, um, 
the key takeaway points that I would have um, for the client base is review, um, advice, and a proactive discussion then um, in this period. Hilary, now that, that moves us on quite nicely because um, that question was framed that the business had just reopened. Um, and another question has come in, uh, phrased along the lines that businesses are now looking forward um, to life after lockdown and returning to the new normal, whatever that is. So what steps should they be considering to re-engage with the supply chain and refocus business critical contracts? Thanks, Aaron. Well, you know, as you know, most manufacturing businesses depend heavily on an effective supply chain. So as we see an easing of lockdown restrictions and, and a return to a, to a new normal, whatever that looks like, these businesses will start to grapple with, with effectively changes in supply and demand in a sort of post-COVID era, and also as different parts of the world unlock in different ways and at different rates. So effectively tr trying to get to grips with that new supply and demand is probably at the, at the forefront of, of, of a business's mind at this point. So, I mean, it goes without saying it's very simple, but the first thing we would say is talk to your customers. If you can understand the changes in their forecasting, the changes um, in, in, in what they expect in, ter in terms of demand, um, you'll be much uh, more ready to make those changes. I mean, it's, it's also bear in mind that the ch that demand can go up, it can go down, um, depending on the nature of the business. Um, so you need to be prepared to meet both, but actually um, probably more likely is, is it could be inconsistent for a while. So you could see you know, peaks and troughs in demand and it, that's gonna be very difficult for your business to meet if it's not aware of that. So getting that information early will be critical. I suppose the second thing then I would say is, um, which feeds on from that, which is really good account management. So just really keep on top of your account management. Um, communication is obviously critical. Um, understanding what, what's going on. But, but also an aspect of that is feeding that down to the people in your organization that need to know. So for instance, the, the team that probably springs to mind most obviously is the sales team. So whatever information you glean from your customer, what do your sales team need to know? How do they need to adapt? Maybe they need more training. Maybe they need new products or a new way to deliver uh, products or services that looks a bit different in a, in a sort of post-COVID environment. So um, making sure that you feed that information down to, within your own organization to the people that need to know is, is critical. And then finally, I would say, look at your contract terms. So those contracts were negotiated in a, in a, a pre-lockdown environment. Um, so what changes maybe do you need to look at? or try to negotiate in those terms. So I'm thinking, first of all, I suppose we all know that at this point in time, cash, cash flow is, is in the forefront of everyone's mind. So um, for any business, they're going to want to maximize their cash. So looking at the pricing terms and looking at the payment terms, um, you know, do, do, do you need to amend those? Do you need to try and negotiate different terms that work more effectively in this environment? Um, I've said about forecast, so looking at what your contract says about forecasting um, and also what the consequences of if a customer can't meet those forecasts and um, what, the, what the legal consequences of that, of that is. <clears throat> um, during the lockdown, did you serve any force majeure notices? Um, if you did, how, what steps do you need to take now to reactivate those contracts if indeed that's what you're going to do? And then I suppose another area would be delivery obligations. Do those delivery obligations still work in this post post um, lockdown environment, or do you need to negotiate you no know, longer lead times get given changes in in your supply chain? So once you once you've done all that and you get a, a clear view from your customers of, of what as far as they can tell of what the, of the future um, in the next number of months uh, years is going to look like, then you need to to look at your supply chain. Um, and we've said this in previous webinars. Obviously, assessing um, the state of your supply chain is is critical because ninety percent of your supply chain might be fine, but if the ten percent that's not fine is critical to your business, it will still have a dramatic or could have a dramatic impact. So it's not so much about the percentage as as about how critical those suppliers are to your business. So you, you might find you have a range of suppliers. You'll have suppliers who are are ready to trade largely unaffected um, and, and they're good to go. Um, but most likely you're still going to have a category of suppliers who um, have restrictions, who, who are still dealing with the aftermath of lockdown, um, who may still be in geographical areas where they are still more heavily restricted. So um, I think 
um, probably the key to that is, is again strong collaborative relationships if you can start talking to them start talking about how together you manage the situation you may find that some of your supply chain are have overstock because um, before all, all of this blew up obviously people were actually overstocking a bit anyway because of brexit planning so you might find that, that, that suppliers are sitting there with with larger levels of stock well now would be the time to negotiate you know lower pricing for the stock or, or better terms so the more you can understand about that and about your supplier situation obviously the, the better deal you'll be able to get um, and, and and the better chance you have of navigating through this with strong relationships with your suppliers and, and coming out the other side yeah so i mean <laughs> to date it's a fairly consistent message here of um, review re-engagement and engagement and proactive communication um, which leads us nicely on joe to the new normal as we, have we described it um i would imagine an awful lot of people are going to be looking at their um commercial property needs etc so what options are available to landlords and tenants who are concerned about their property interests well there are a range of options and um we've already seen some very interesting arrangements put together by landlords and tenants who have been proactive I think it's fair to say that most of the government intervention to date in this area has been targeted to benefit mostly tenants and I'm thinking about things like moratoriums on forfeiture and things like the initiatives that Jeanette talked about um, in the insolvency and prohibitions there and restrictions. But I think tenants need to be aware that where they're not paying rent currently, that rent is accruing. It's still owing and indeed there's probably interest accruing on top of that. So I think for both landlords and tenants, uh, the critical point here is to avoid the temptation to bury your head in the sand. And there are things that can be done. There are arrangements that can be put in place which are mutually beneficial for both landlords and tenants. And they're likely to include some form of rent concession, but that can take many forms. Um, and from the landlord's point of view, there are things that can be done in terms of re-gearing leases removal of certain clauses that are of importance to landlords to give them more stability and security. So I think the thing I would say in conclusion is that the parties should engage with each other and, and do that as soon as possible. But the other critical and very important thing is that when any arrangements are agreed in principle that they are correctly documented. And that can be by way of a, a well-drafted side letter but also be aware that there are certain circumstances where a more formal data variation would be required. Okay, thanks for that, Joe. Um, yeah, I suppose that that moves the message on to having reviewed, having communicated, having re-engaged. That if you're starting to reach resolutions about properly documenting them, which I think is um, very relevant advice as well. Actually, and I'm going to circle back to you because the theme here, in terms of the questions that have come in are all very much focused about getting back to work um, and I would imagine that an awful lot of our manufacturing contacts and clients will want to know is there specific sector focused guidance for manufacturers in relation to workplace safety and returning to work? Yeah as you say Aaron health and safety is a key issue you know particularly in the manufacturing sector um, and there have been a number of media reports about businesses where there are issues about how they're operating, whether they're able to maintain the social distancing. So I suppose the first place to look is, is to the, the NI executive and, and you know, what guidance they've produced. And we have the, you know, the pathway to recovery um, that we're all working our way through with the five steps. And there's some useful guidance available on the health and safety executive NI website. But we don't actually have sector specific guidance yet in Northern Ireland, which I think is a bit of a problem and um, it has been discussed um, and I think it, it might be coming, but it will almost be too late, which is why we're advising clients, you know, to look at what has been actually produced and published in England and Wales, because the principles are all the same. It's incredibly useful and for manufacturing um, clients, the relevant document is the, the factory plant and, and warehouse guidance. Um, and that sets out a very comprehensive step-by-step -step guide as to what you should be thinking of as a business when you transition into work, you know, back to work. I mean, many manufacturing um, businesses have continued to operate. Um, and so I suppose they're already ahead of the game in that respect. But for manufacturers who've, 
you know, have had to shut down or are only slowly, you know, reintegrating their workforce. Um, really, that's the first place to start. Look at that guidance and uh, a health and safety risk assessment um, is really the starting point. There, there is a useful template on the HSCNI website. So if you don't have a, a risk assessment template, um, that's a good starting point. And then I think, Aaron, you mentioned, you know, um, proactive communication. Um, and that's the key. It's the key in relation to transitioning back to work so that any health and safety issues are flushed out. So health and safety and I would recommend that when you're going through your risk assessment, you engage with your employees, you talk to your health and safety representatives. If you're unionized, you know, you talk to your union so that if there are any issues, if people are concerned about distancing and about being able to maintain the safety, that that's all flushed out and addressed during the health and safety risk assessment process. And then that's less likely to lead to employment disputes and claims, you know, further down the line, because I think that is a concern for many businesses, you know, that if they don't get it right now, that they're potentially walking themselves into tribunal claims and, and disputes and grievances um, and health and safety complaints. And, you know, obviously every employer in the jurisdiction is subject to the, you know, the 1978 health and safety NI order. And there are also, you know, the common law health and safety obligations. So, you know, it's difficult for employers to get everything right, but certainly that document is helpful, that factories um, guidance produced. It's on the, you know, the, the .gov um, website, and it sets out how you work through the issues, common areas, um, you know, how you uh, reopen your canteens, um, whether you just, you know, continue to do a cold food offering, whether people will just bring their own food to work, um, how you mask out uh, two meter spacing on the floors of, of your, you know, your factories, etc. Um, so follow the guidance, I think, and, and engage, communicate. Thanks, actually. And I suppose, yeah, it's, it's I mean, it, one of the frustrations that we're seeing is the, the vacuum at times in terms of the availability of guidance. So it's, it's, it's good to get a steer on the availability of guidance elsewhere um, and to work backwards from that. And I think that there really is a, a key communication message um, in that vacuum as well of protecting yourself by proactively communicating. So Jeanette, we've, we've thought about um, reviewing our contracts, we've thought about reviewing our leases, we've thought about reviewing our banking relationships. Um, we're at the stage now where we're getting ourselves reopened and, and we're looking at our specific guidance. But what if we're concerned about the actual financial viability of the business and the burning question of should I continue to trade? Yeah, well, I think um, firstly, you really need to get to grips immediately with the financial position of your business. Um, and this is going to involve creating a balance sheet and a cash flow forecast. These documents don't need to be penny perfect, but they do need to be realistic as you're going to be using them to consider whether or not the business is insolvent now or may become insolvent in the foreseeable future. If you don't have the skills or resources within your own organization to pull these documents together, um, even at a high level, um, you really should consult with your accountant to assist in their preparation. There are potentially serious consequences to continue to trade a business whilst insolvent. Insolvency is a legal term um, and the definition is contained within Article 103 of the Insolvency Northern Ireland Order 1989. There are two tests for insolvency. The first test is based on cash flow. Um, so does your business have the cash or resources to pay its debts as they fall due? And um, what that means is if a creditor or a number of creditors presents you with an invoice, um, do you have the means to pay that invoice within the um, credit terms provided? If the answer to that is no, then your business is deemed to be insolvent. The second test is a balance sheet test and put very simply, where the liabilities exceed the assets of the business, the business is insolvent. So as a business owner, it is very important that you have reliable financial information and cash flow forecasts to enable you to make informed decisions on the continued trading of the business. So once you have reviewed the financial position, um, if you're of the view that the business is insolvent now, or may become insolvent in the foreseeable future, then you do need to seek urgent advice from a lawyer and possibly an insolvency practitioner. I would stress that just because your business is insolvent, it doesn't mean that that's the end of the road for you. 
There are rescue options um, which may be viable for your business, such as a voluntary arrangement or the appointment of an administrator, which could result in all or part of your business being preserved. I mentioned earlier the imminent introduction of the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Bill, and this creates another option for you. Uh, there is a new company moratorium whereby a company can obtain a moratorium for a period of 20 days to put in place a rescue plan. It is therefore very important to seek early and proper advice from an expert so that you're aware of your options. I did mention earlier that there is potentially serious implications for you personally to continue to trade a business and incur additional creditors whilst you knew or ought to have known the business is insolvent if the business ultimately enters an infor a formal insolvency procedure. Uh, the appointed insolvency practitioner will review any transactions entered into in the run-up of the insolvency. They will assess whether any transactions might be challenged under antecedent transactions provisions contained within the insolvency Northern Ireland order. This provides an opportunity to bring money or assets back into the company's estate to make it available for creditors. And if you as a director fall foul of the antecedent transactions provisions, you may be required to personally make payment of funds. The Corporate Insolvency and Governance Bill provides a temporary stay for director's conduct, which could amount to wrongful trading during the period of the 1st of March 2020 to the 30th of June 2020. And this is very welcome for those directors who have been trading their businesses with very limited resources and under lockdown restrictions. So given the possible uh, and personal recourse for directors continuing to trade during this uncertain term, it is very important that you do take early and proper advice. Thanks, Jeanette. So we've heard all of the, all of the above and, and really positively thinking about how do I proactively manage my way through this. Hilary, something that isn't always necessarily um, on the minds of businesses um, sometimes, I mean, um, operating businesses, it seems like a secondary consideration really is the corporate governance piece. However, I mean, in my mind, it's probably never been more critical than now. So what areas of governance should be at the forefront of directors' minds as they navigate a return to some degree of normality? Yeah, um, I, I think this, the, well, I suppose what I'm going to talk about probably, um, you know, is relevant to everything that we've discussed up to this point on the webinar. And you're right, our experience indicates that actually when people are faced with very difficult and pressurised situations, um, governance is the first thing to go when it probably should be the last. Um, people are under pressure, they're making difficult decisions, they're um, distracted by business needs, etc. Um, and so yes, governance can get overlooked. Um, uh, and it really, they, you can't afford to do that probably is the message. Um, you can protect your business and yourself in, in very critical ways by having good governance throughout, throughout a time of crisis and uncertainty. I suppose the first point um, is, is, is a reminder about director's duties and they are obviously codified in the Companies Act and not to go into the detail of those and we can advise on them in more detail. But um, obviously the paramount duty is to make decisions that are most likely to promote the success of the company. And it's probably important to bear that in mind as you enter a period where you're going to have to make difficult decisions, you're going to have competing interests, um, you're going to be pulled here and there and, 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 and have to make those tough decisions and maybe have to make them very quickly. Um, so so to, to, to bear in mind that, that your duty as a director is to make decisions that will promote the success of the company. Not any individual shareholder, um, not the employees, uh, the, the company itself, and, and that, that may ultimately mean making difficult decisions. It's a high bar, um, making a decision that's most likely to promote the success of the company. It's a fairly high bar, so it's important to bear that in mind. Which brings me on to something that's probably been alluded to throughout this webinar, which is record keeping. It has never been more important than now to keep records um, of your decisions, and actually, more importantly, of the decisions you, you chose not to, to make. Um, so board papers, board minutes, the reasoning behind decisions taken or not taken, they're, they're all um, become more critical. Um, the courts remain, thankfully, fairly reluctant to interfere in commercial decisions. But having said that, good record keeping and, and evidence of your reasoning can become actually critical if you do end up in that type of scenario. 
And I've, again, I've touched on it. Um, the directors do need to have regard to other interested parties. So those are your employees, your, your customers, um, your suppliers, your investors. You, you do need to have regard to those people. But it's all, all balanced against the overarching um, obligation, which is to make decisions which promote the success of the company. So it may be, unfortunately, that in the months, years ahead, you have to make quite difficult decisions, which will have impact on, on, on categories of your stakeholders. Um, unfortunately, you have to have your overarching duty to the company at the forefront of your mind. Um, creditors, I'm not going to, to sort of um, dwell on this because Jeanette has covered this already. Obviously, creditors can move from being a group of stakeholders or interested parties to being at the top of the list if you're looking at an insolvency situation or a potential insolvency situation. So it probably goes without saying that keeping your, keeping your creditors informed, keeping an, an idea of where you are in terms of your creditors is absolutely crucial. The one thing I would say, the observation I have, is that I think the banks have to deal, obviously, in the light of the circumstances, been reluctant to drive companies into insolvent situations. Um, and companies have also been, um, as we've discussed, um, availing of government um, initiatives and help and support. Um, however, it could be that that creates a bit of a, um, a false sense of security or that the, the full implications for your business might not become apparent until further down the line. So I suppose I can't stress enough keep, keeping on top of, uh, Jeanette's already talked about it, your, your forecasting and your cash flow and, and looking at your creditors. Investors are another category, can sometimes be forgotten, but if you have um, people who have, uh, they're, not, they're not creditors, but they have an equity stake in your business, quite often they can have um, quite um, absolute powers over your business, over the control of it. And if they see things heading in the wrong direction, um, they can they can uh, make fairly drastic decisions for your business. Um, so obviously bear in mind that your investors are there, know what your investment documentation says in respect of the control that those investors have, um, your obligations to report to them, to keep them informed. Obviously, uh, the more you can keep your relationships um, uh, communicating well and very informed, you know, the better it will be for your business. Thanks, Hilary. Um, again, I suppose that's a, I mean, the, the overriding sort of concepts that are flowing through here is proactive engagement, um, a proactive review of your governance structures, and then good record keeping as well. So um, I always like uh, consistency throughout these things. Joe, just to um, finalise matters then in terms of the last question, we seem to have got ourselves all the way to the stage of reopening now at this stage and we've completed all our reviews. So why should companies now be actively reviewing their leases and property deeds? Well, I think there's no doubt that the commercial property landscape has changed utterly. And not, I'm not just thinking about the high street and retail here. I mean, as Ashley has touched upon, all businesses will now have to grapple with the challenges of workspace um, safety. Um, businesses will no doubt want to be looking at their need for space and surplus stock. Um, the traditional office setup has changed, at least for now. Um, warehousing may become more important. The traditional office setup probably less so. So I think it just makes, it makes perfect business sense for businesses to be looking at this now and reviewing their property documents, um, you know, be it freehold, leasehold and the purpose of any review will be to look at things like what entity holds the property and um, are they the appropriate entity to be holding the property um, where the property needs to be repurposed what is the planning position there are third-party consents required um, if there is surplus stock what are the barriers to being able to divest yourself uh, of that stock and also where um, alterations need to be made um, to the properties, are um, who's liable to pay for that? Are, are there any third parties um, who are liable to pay for that? And also, there may be um, in the horizon reorganisations required. And again, it'd be worth looking at. Well, what are the barriers to that? Um, again, are third party consents required? Um, what needs to happen for that to be possible? So, at the very least, I would be saying to businesses to undertake a very high level review of their property documentation both to look at potential issues and challenges, but also to highlight options and opportunities. And also where businesses then have identified particular properties or particular things that they want to do, it, become, it can become a specific um, look at their property documentation to see what obstacles are in the way before that can happen. 
Thanks, Joe. That's been a very informative session. Um, we've, we've covered quite a lot of information there, so thanks to the panel. Um, I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Aaron. To conclude, um, on behalf of Cleaver Foot and Reckon, I'd like to thank everyone for watching us today. I hope you find the information delivered and the questions addressed to be useful. Um, please remember to access our manufacturing business audit at cleaverfultonrankin.co.uk forward slash COVID-19 to highlight the key strategic issues that you should be urgently addressing. If you require any further advice or assistance on anything that we cover today, all our speakers' contact details are available at cleaverfieldandrankin.co.uk forward slash people. Thank you.